<laughs> Coming in live, I did not push the button on time, but we're back. And uh, these uh, uh, sessions are uh, late in loading. It takes them a long time to load. Anyway, we're going back to uh, Moses on the or Exodus on the end at, uh, at uh, verse 24 and following, which is an interesting episode where God uh, evidently comes after Moses. And then there's a circumcision thing that takes place by his wife, who is not Jewish. Okay, she is a pagan, uh, a Midianite, a Gentile, and she institutes a custom of circumcision to protect Moses and Moses' sons from a God who is trying to kill them. And we don't understand why God necessarily would want to. There are some theories. But the idea of circumcision is something that is uh, pervasive all through mm -hmm. the Old Testament. And there is just, there's something about it where it's a, a rite of um, almost like what we consider baptism today, where the firstborn or any male is dedicated to God, and this is the sign that they are dedicated to God. So what she's doing is dedicating her son to God and imputing that dedication to her husband Moses so that God will not kill them. Okay, we're going to see how blood all through the Bible is used as a shield against divine retribution. Okay, and that's true in the New Testament as well. Okay, the Lord said to Aaron, see now God's talking to Aaron, go into the wilderness and meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. Go into the wilderness and meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him and all the signs which he had charged him to do. Then Moses and Aaron and went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Which means that the slave population had a, an organization. They had leadership. It was like a council. But it was very much like the councils that the Nazis put together within the Jewish community to control the Jews for the sake of the Nazis. And they would, uh, they would figure out who was going to be deported, who wasn't going to be deported, how the work structure was going to go, how food was distributed within the community, so that when people got mad, they would look at, the, at their own leadership, not so much at the Nazis for what was going on. The Egyptians were doing the same thing. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs. These are the magic tricks, okay? Uh, in the sight of the people, and the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that they had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshipped. All right. <clears throat> Moses and Aaron first have to convince their own people that they are God's people. It does no good to go see Pharaoh and say, God says, let my people go, if my people don't think that they're his people. So... You know, uh, they first have to convince their own people. The magic tricks do a good job. And, uh, and the reference to an ancestral god of some sort is um, refreshing because the people really feel that they're being oppressed and there's, you know, they need some relief. So they're asking God, they're asking any god. <laughs> because they're not believing in the, our god at this point. They don't have much confidence in whatever God there was, because if they really had a God, then why are they slaves? You know, how did they get to be persecuted? So whatever God their ancestors believed in might have just died with their ancestors. Well, are they at that point considered uh, God's people, like the Jews? Think they are or whatever. There, there was an ancient story of a god of their ancestors back in Canaan. <laughs> Go ahead. Why, why are you calling God's signs magic tricks? Because that's what they appeared to be to us. Okay, like for instance, taking the taking the staff and throwing it down, it becomes a snake. Okay. Um, sticking your hand in your cloak and it comes out leprous and then you stick your hand in the cloak again and you know uh, it, 
comes out clean. And the people have never seen anything like that. All right? But in terms of the context for what was going on back then, magic tricks were very common within paganism as a way of validating whatever god or goddess uh, was doing that. So one of the one of the facilities of priests, pagan priests, was that they could perform signs and wonders of some sort. And um, I, like I, I said last Sunday, we, Peggy and I have been watching the Carbonaro effect on, on uh, TV. And uh, he's a, a young magician, and he does he goes into stores and stuff, and he just does the most incredible, you can't explain any of it, tricks. Okay? Um, you know, he'll do... You know, somebody brought in a, a sleeping bag to return to the shop, and it was in a little contain, you know, pack. And uh, and so he said, "Well, I got to open it up and see if it's okay." And he opens it up, and there's like a a six foot boa constrictor in it. You know, <laughs> you know, and it's right there. He hasn't left the counter or anything. It's just right in there. You know, there are all kinds of things that the guy does, and it's it's remarkable. And there's, you know, of course, he's not going to explain any of it. But that's the kind of thing that was going on commonly within religions at that day. And so when God wants to explain that God has power, he's using a medium that everybody else understands as an evidence of a deity. But you, but so you're, you're saying that it was a miracle, not a magic trick. Yes. yes. Yeah, but the Egyptians, the Egyptians could do it too. They could do it later, too. They have a staff, they throw it down. Right. So it is somewhat of a magic trick. It is. But not from the Lord. Okay. It's not from God. Okay, from, from God's It's a sign and a miracle. It is a sign and a miracle, but it's but not it's out of the context of what people are used to seeing as a deity. And it's not something that can't be replicated. Hmm. Okay. Well, is this not the forerunner of all the plagues that he's, he's just yes, it actually is. going from something that everybody else can do to this is what I can do and nobody else can do it? Right. Mm -hmm. The first thing that Moses is trying to establish or God is trying to establish through these signs is that we are talking about an actual God. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the first thing. Okay. The, what's going to be needed in order to convince Pharaoh to let the people go is in a different realm altogether. Okay. So you're really not you're not saying that it didn't come from God and it wasn't. You you're 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 concerned about. Moses wasn't trained how to do the magic. What? Moses was not trained in how to do the magic. What was going on really was evidence of a deity in what Moses was doing. It was not merely a trick, but it was in the context of the tricks that were used to validate a deity. That's how you, you, God was getting their attention. Yeah, Just God was getting their attention and, and validating that God was God. Okay. Um, it's just like back then people would look to the stars for messages and even, you know, the star of Bethlehem and that sort of thing. Why did God speak through the stars? Because that's where people were looking to get answers from a deity. Okay. And, you know, God is going to use techniques to communicate with us that we commonly use to communicate with God. At right. the time, you know, and today it would be... <laughs> well, I mean, you know. Facebook. Well, I'm, I'm just, you know, it's, it's whatever's at the, you know, whatever's happening at the time. God hasn't gotten into social media so much yet, <laughs> okay, except through things like this. But um, right. See, I think today's example is I feel like God communicates to me through communion. Mm -hmm. When we go up and take communion. Right. Yeah. You know, like the body and the blood, mm -hmm. but it's not. It's grape juice and bread. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of right. Yeah. yeah. Um, That's symbolic. Right. Yeah. You know, like for instance, I have a I have a Tibetan prayer wheel at home, and it's a little wheel on a handle with a a weight on it, and you spin it, and every time it goes around, it's a prayer. Okay. And we say, well, yeah, something like that. Okay, a rosary. 
okay? Or for a Muslim, the, the worry beads. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, these are techniques that people use to communicate with God. But, and, and we as Christians say, well, I wouldn't do that. Well, maybe you wouldn't, but maybe God speaks to people who are trying to communicate. What God is looking for in us is a desire to communicate more than anything else, more than the technique. God is looking for a way to communicate with us. And, uh, and anybody who is open to that, mm -hmm. I think God will communicate with. That's nice. You know, and sometimes, sometimes it's not something where you hear a voice or something like that. It's just things that happen in your life and you say, oh, I see the hand of God in that. Okay. So uh, this is just a medium that God is using, but it's a familiar medium. I'll tell you something. I uh, I told Carl this, but uh, every now and then I have to to get take one of the dogs out at night, and usually around two or three or something, which is no big deal. But and I was having a problem with uh, God hearing me or whatever, mm -hmm. and so I would go through the family room and into the lead mountain, I'd look at the old clock and four or five times it was 316. Oh. oh. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, when I'm thinking that, you know, I'm still not completely there. And the other night, that's what happened. It was 316. On the clock. On the clock. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I didn't know that God was on the clock. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's not necessarily on the clock. No, well, yeah, he's on the uh, radio. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> but he knows how to do it. God knows how to do it. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's true. And I know all of you have had experiences like this, or you wouldn't be here. That God has spoken to you somewhere in your life. Uh, sometimes with things that you wanted to hear, sometimes things that you didn't. Uh, but you have seen things in your life that validate that there is a God trying to communicate with you. A God wink. A God yeah. wink. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or sometimes with me, a scowl. I don't know. The hardest thing that I've had to learn over the years is that we grow from our struggles. Yeah. You know, the... Uh, Trimming of the branches. Mm -hmm. uh, that was, a, it's really hard to understand why we have the problems that we have, but it makes us better people and helps us to grow. And that was hard for me to grasp, I, I guess. Every once in a while, every once in a while, you know, when somebody in my family will have a really tough time, some event happens, and it's happened to me. You know, you lose a job or something. There's a transition that you hadn't expected, didn't want, set you back. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, it doesn't feel like a blessing yet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I feel really blessed because I was born during the Hitler time mm -hmm. and grew up and we had to go hungry. And we had a field government camp in my town, so the Americans did not bomb us in my town. Mm -hmm. Most were about like 13. Mm -hmm. Oh. And I feel like the Lord has blessed me so much. You know, I was, I'm widowed twice, uh -huh. but I had two good marriages, and I don't have to worry about anything financially. So I feel like the Lord has blessed me, and He blesses me every day. Because I'm so forgetful, I'm old and I forget my ladies now. And I, forget I say, Lord, help me, and He is there every time He helps me. And you know, I pray for the whole world. Yes. Every day, because people are falling away from God, and it's it's bad. It is bad. Uh, you see the evidence of it. Yeah. You yeah. see the evidence of it. Yeah. And uh, and <clears throat> there are people who say, oh, you know, uh, the whole world's going to hell in a handbasket. Well, it's in the handbasket, but it isn't in <laughs> hell yet. And 
and things have a, I, I see the pendulum coming back. I really do. I see, I see people resisting this trend. And, uh, and I have faith that we will. You know, I, we started watching on PBS, the American, it's, a, it's, it's um, our, what's his name? The guy that does all the beautiful. Yeah. Yes. But he's talking about the Amer American's reaction to the Holocaust. Yes. To, and the, to the Holocaust oh, and, the, and right. the influx of Jews that were trying to come to the United States. It's just like it is now. Nothing ever changes. I mean, y'all, it's, exactly. like, it's always been the same. It's, it's, it's so interesting how, you know, um, well, at, at the time of the war, or, or prior to the war, we had really tough immigration laws at that time because of it. And, you know, those poor Jewish people were trying to get here. and it, We hadn't watched for the first movie. But it was like nothing is new under the sun. Nothing's no worse now than it's ever been. And I learned, I've learned that more from you, I think, than anybody. But I truly feel that way. I truly feel that I don't. God is. Maybe people are turning away from God. And I read that or another article about things are too. We have too many conveniences now. You know, before people didn't. They had to rely on their faith because they couldn't rely on anything else. Now people have so many other things they can rely on. That's different. But. I don't know. I think I don't. I have my glass half full, right? What I'm what I'm finding is that people have uh, greater cap greater capabilities today than they have ever had before. Right. And human nature itself has not changed. So what we will see is a greater capability for evil and a greater capability for good. And the question is, what's going on within the humans? And how related are we to, to the God who, in whose image we are created? You know, to what degree are humans uh, discovering more and more about, um, about their purpose and about... Uh, what is it, Craig says, how is it with your soul? How is yes. it with your soul, yes. yes. Um, what I see overall, because I'm a student of history, but over the course of generations, there's a lot about human nature that has not changed, okay? But over the course of history, we see uh, better standards today for human behavior than we have ever seen before. It used to be that Russia could do what Russia is doing without anybody batting an eye because that's just what happens, you know. Now people are paying attention, okay, and the stakes are higher. Well, it's like you, you said that things are so much better technologically. Uh, it, everything is instant now, so you know yes, exactly uh, yes. what's going on or somebody will know. Yeah, and the problem that we've got is the same one that Moses has got. We think that God is an instant thing, too. Mm -hmm. when, you, when you say the word people have more capabilities, are, are, you, are you defining capabilities as freedom? No. So what, what do you mean by capabilities? They can accomplish more. Like, for instance, uh, workers in the United States are more productive now than they have ever been. But they are productive because they have computers, cell phones, mm -hmm. copy machines, you know, things like that. You know, I recall... <laughs> Well, when I was learning how to write in school, give you an idea how old I am, I learned calligraphy with a quill. So, you know, and an inkwell in the desk. Um, I go back that far. So I just want you to know that the technology has changed. It has changed. Well, anyway, we've got to wrap this up. And um, thank you all for being here. Welcome to the new folks that are with us. I know that you're going to be able to add a lot to the discussion in the class because history does repeat itself. I, I remember my grandmother was a snow Catholic. Uh huh. And she was always there. I remember her having Bible study at home with a friend. And uh, she was, like I said, she was a, she was flag bearer for the woman society. But now let me tell you, in Germany, Germany had no separation of religion. 
and stay. That's right. And the Catholics run the country. All the teachers were Catholic nuns. All the nurses were Catholic nuns. And all the caretakers in the nursing homes were Catholic nuns. And my grandmother was a super Catholic. And one day, the two people died. A rich man uh, committed suicide, which is a, a, a top sin in the Catholic religion. Yes. And a poor man died from natural causes. Well, the rich man was buried with five priests, and the poor man was just put in a hole with no priests. And my grandmother said the Catholic Church, which is one of the richest churches in the world, is just out after the money that turned away from Catholicism. Mm, sounds like Martin Luther's. <laughs> let's, yeah. uh, let's close with a word of prayer. Our Father, we do thank you for the lessons of history, and we thank you for chapter 4, which is confusing, yes. but at the same time enlightening. And help us to, to understand our own faith in you and our own dialogue with you as we go through these lessons and through life. Bless everyone here, keep us all safe, and bring us back to you next Sunday, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, and Van, thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Don't look for that, dude. We're not going to get that. We're not going to get that. Well, we get back if there's a sign. We can pull those at home out of the door. We should be. We should be. We should be. We should be.